So hey everyone, welcome to the Drupal NYC meetup. Um, ooh, let's see here. Somebody's wondering about where the video is. All right, so I don't know if everybody can see what I'm presenting right now, but if you can't, um, you should see in the top right corner of the screen uh, presentation, um, or you can click on the 36 people uh, icon and you should be able to find the presentation there. Um, if anybody has trouble with that, just uh, you can unmute yourself and speak up and we'll figure it out. All right, so now I have to figure out how I change slides while I'm looking at the meetup here. <laughs> okay. Let's see what happens here. Hey, that worked. Cool. All right, so um, some housekeeping. Uh, please feel free to turn on that video camera. Um, consider using your phone as a second connection to the meeting, um, your smartphone, so we can see your pretty face on there. Um, you know, we're, a, we're usually an in-person community, and we want to try to replicate that as best we can. Um, Google Meet does a good job of keeping you muted uh, as long as you don't unmute yourself. Um, but if you do unmute yourself, please mute yourself again um, when you're not speaking so that we don't get feedback and fun stuff like that. Um, when our speakers, who are going to be presenting shortly, um, are talking, uh, please feel free to politely interrupt them with your questions. Um, unmute yourself, uh, otherwise they can't hear you. <laughs> um, and uh, they'll, they'll do their best to, to answer your question. Um, so uh, you probably already heard, but we're not using Google Meet's text chat uh, today because uh, it interrupts the speaker, and it also doesn't last beyond the meetup. Um, so please do join the meetup channel in Drupal NYC Slack. Uh, you can go to drupalnyc.org slash slack for the links and instructions on how to get yourself set up there. Uh, and please go ahead and introduce yourself uh, to other meetup attendees there in the meetup channel. Um, you can, you know, say where you're from and, you know, what's going on. If you are uh, hiring or, or looking to hire, uh, you can post in there as well. Also, there is a job post channel in Slack, which is a great place to uh, seek uh, employment or uh, offer jobs or contracts up. Um, so definitely recommend that you do that. All right. Um, so soon, coming soon, we've got some lightning talks. Uh, first, we're going to hear from Rachel Lawson, uh, entitled Quite Busy, uh, talking about the Drupal Association. And then we're going to hear from Eleanor Y about uh, introducing the Drupal Views UI. Looking forward to those. And then after that, uh, we've got some longer talks. Um, Matt Gwayman's going to talk about expanding JSON API support in Drupal Commerce. And Elijah Lynn is going to talk about debugging with HTTP Toolkit. Very cool. So today's meetup is organized by these fine people here. Uh, and that's based on the work of past organizers in the Drupal NYC board. Uh, if you don't know, Drupal NYC Incorporated is a 501c3 nonprofit based in New York um, to uh, facilitate the Drupal community here, uh, among other things. Um, and if you want to get involved, we'd love, love your help organizing the next meetup. Uh, you can join meetup organize, dash organize on Drupal NYC Slack, um, or get in touch with an organizer if you, you know, are having trouble with that, and we'll, we'll get you plugged in. Um, so speaking of connecting, uh, we're also active on Twitter. Uh, you can follow us at Drupal NYC, uh, and of course, Slack. You hear lots about Slack. You get really tired of hearing about Slack today. Um, we always uh, encourage everyone to support the Drupal Association. Um, you know, we're going to hear from uh, from Rachel uh, Lawson of the DA uh, in a little bit, and I'm sure she'll talk some more about that. Uh, but they do a lot of great work uh, for the Drupal Open Source Project and for the Drupal community. Uh, and you know, we probably wouldn't be here uh, without their good work. So uh, please consider becoming a member. OK, so some upcoming events. Um, so a lot of things are going virtual, as you know. Um, so Drupal Camp Asheville, uh, July 10 through 12. Uh, DrupalCon Global 2020, uh, which is a, a, new, a new shtick. Uh, and I know Rachel's going to talk about that. That's July 14 to 17. Uh, and then Decoupled Days, which is right here in New York City, is going to be right here in New York City online, um, July 22 to 23. Uh, Drupal GovCon in Bethesda, as of now, uh, is still publicly planning on an in-person 
uh, meetup. Um, and I think they're deciding uh, on that later this month uh, as far as, you know, whether they need to, to alter that plan and if so, how. Uh, then Drupal Camp Atlanta in September. And we're very excited about Drupal Camp NYC 2020 uh, in October or November. And uh, we'll hear a little bit from our lead organizer, uh, Vasil, about that a little later. All right. So, oh, later is now. <laughs> Vas, are you there? Sure. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, go for it. Cool. So thanks, JD. Uh, nice to see you all. Uh, as you know, as uh, JD mentioned, we have, we're planning the Drupal Camp NYC. So we have two dates, October and November. We're actually uh, struggling to choose which one. We are waiting for the confirmation on the venue, which is, uh, can, I, can I say it, JD? Yeah, I think I can say it. Yeah, it's Microsoft, which we're very happy about it. So basically, yeah, we've made a lot of progress since our last meetup. Uh, we have uh, weekly meetings and currently we're working on the website content. So the website should be live very soon. So st stay tuned about that. Uh, if you want to get involved, please uh, write us at camp uh, volunteer org. If you want to sponsor the camp, which is you know a very noble thing to do, you can do that at uh, camp-sponsor at drupalnyc.org. And yeah, stay tuned for more info and join us. We need volunteers. We need you. Good deal. Thanks, Voss. All right. And in other news, we've got another website, drupalnyc.org. It's our main website, and uh, it needs your help. <laughs> uh, even if you don't have any experience, um, join website-improve on, on uh, our Slack uh, to get involved, and we'll mentor you. It's a great opportunity if you don't have a lot of experience with Drupal 8 websites or with best practices for developing uh, Drupal websites. Um, you know, consider it a, a free kind of training opportunity, uh, as well as uh, hopefully being able to contribute back uh, to that site. Um, so we'd love to see you there. Uh, and if you're interested in speaking at an upcoming meetup, uh, you can talk for any length. It can be a beginner's talk, an advanced talk, and even be non drupal -y. Um, just contact an organizer, or you can email speak at drupalnyc.org, and we will help you figure out what to speak on if you don't have an idea already. Um, and we're especially interested in first-time speakers, folks who have never spoken before at uh, a Drupal meetup or a Drupal camp or anything like that. We would love to um, to help you, uh, you know, have your have your first time there. Okay, so. Alex Ross was going to be emceeing tonight, but he's he's in the middle of a work emergency. So uh, this is his adorable son. I don't know his name. <laughs> Does anybody know Alex Ross's son's name? It's Hen uh, Henry. Henry. That sounds familiar. Yeah. <laughs> Henry, thank you. So Henry's here, and uh, Henry wants to know who is hiring. Um, so if anyone on the call right now is looking to fill a position or has a contract that they're looking to find uh, someone Drupal-y uh, to, to help out with. I uh, invite, your, invite you to uh, unmute yourself and speak up and let us know what you're looking for and how we can uh, contact you. Hi, my name is Ian. I'm not actually hiring, but I got an interesting uh, job offer in the, the mail that I was not qualified for. It's a company looking for somebody to do internationalization team lead in Drupal, if anybody's interested. Uh, ian.finlay at trustee.care. Thanks, Ian. Anybody else hiring or, or know of opportunities? Going once, going twice. Hang on, I'll jump in. So this is Robbie. Uh, I am no longer there, but USDS is always hiring. The United States Digital Service. If you would like to use your tech skills, design skills, product skills, procurement skills, or uh, talent skills to help government agencies solve tech problems and get better benefits to the people who use the agencies. Um, they are always looking for people. They generally look for people who are like five years-ish into their career. You're considered an expert when you walk in the door. But if you would like to take your skills and help government agencies and you're willing to come to DC, talk to USDS. It's usds.gov apply. 
Um, 18F is a sibling organization that also hires, but they do remote. So they do consulting, programming, and engineering um, for the GSA, which is the General Services Administration. If you'd like to chat about any government D stuff, uh, I'm down here in the DC metro area. Feel free to ping me and I'm in the Slack, Robbie the Geek. Awesome, thanks Robbie. All right, anyone else? Any opportunities or thoughts on uh, employment out there? Going once, going twice. Okay, finally, if there are any, uh, anybody out there who's looking for work and they wanna just volunteer, if that's something that they're doing right now, um, I think there are a lot of us out there um, feel free to hop in here. Maybe you're a freelancer or maybe, uh, you know, you, you've got less work now or you're out of work because of the uh, coronavirus. Um, invite you to, uh, to speak up and maybe someone's got a connection for you. Going once. Going twice. Okay, well, I'm a freelancer. <laughs> uh, I'm JD, and uh, I freelance uh, Drupal backend uh, architecture development planning. So uh, if anyone has a good opportunity out there, I'm your man. Anyone else? Anyone else uh, looking for work? I have a question. What is that website you mentioned again? Robbie mentioned US USDS.gov slash apply. I'll drop it in the, the meetup channel. USDS. JD, to make sure everyone knows how to get into Slack, there might be some new people on the, who don't know where that is or what that is. Good point, good point. For anyone who doesn't know, if you look at the slide um, that's shared here, at the very bottom you're going to see uh, the URL drupalnyc.org slash Slack. Uh, and that's where we are uh, communicating during the meetup with each other so that we don't uh, interrupt the speakers. Uh, and also uh, because whatever you say there will live on past this meetup. Um, so we're not using uh, Drupal, sorry, we're not using the Google Meet uh, text chat. All right, anyone else out there with any thoughts before we move on? Okay, we are going to today's first lightning talk. Uh, quite busy by Rachel Lawson. Rachel? Well, hello. I, I hope that uh, you can all hear me and everything. Um, and thanks for inviting me, which is very kind. I'm Rachel Lawson. I'm the community liaison at the Drupal Association, uh, which is a job title that actually I made up uh, <laughs> because we didn't think when we first started to look at the idea of having such a role that community manager was such a great idea. We didn't think that was something that was appropriate in the Drupal community. Uh, being able to liaise and, and, and chat with people seemed far more useful rather than trying to manage. Uh, it seemed wrong. Um, I do get involved in all sorts of things and I'm always available. If anybody wants to talk about anything in the Drupal community at any time, I am around and I'm here to listen. So please do contact me. I'm actually based in the UK. So right now it's half past 11 at night. So we'll see how long I last before I disappear at the end of this, at the end of this. Um, so I want to talk about a lot of the things that the Drupal Association are doing right now. Uh, and I think I want to start that with some of the more obvious things that you've probably seen very much of very recently in the last few weeks. We've had to pivot quite strongly on dealing with the situation that we're all dealing with in many ways with COVID-19 and so on. That's affected us particularly at the Drupal Association with regard to our major way of financing the work that the Drupal Association does. DrupalCon isn't going to exist in the form that it would have existed in a couple of weeks. Um, so as I'm sure you're all aware, that's going to move and we'll talk about all that a bit in, in a second. Uh, but we had to raise some money and thank you. Thank you all because you've done a pretty incredible job, uh, even beyond our wildest hopes in many ways. Um, as of today, we had raised from 
personal donations, actually people like me and you, $79,931 and €21,976 from 950 individuals. There have also been some amazing organizations and they're all listed on uh, drupal.org slash cares. Uh, you can take a look at those. And 1,166 new and renewing Drupal Association individual members, which is really important. That's made a big difference to the things that we can do. Uh, and it means that all of those servers that produce drupal.org, all of those continuous integration testing servers that run all the time, um, they get financed and paid for and are maintained, etc., by the work, by the donations that you've given us. So thank you very much. Now, although the doubling and tripling of the figures that are coming in ended at the end of April, the actual Drupal Cares campaign doesn't finish until the end of May. Yeah, we said we'd try to raise half a million dollars to cover uh the changes due to COVID-19 and we are doing well we're very close to that target we raised over you know hundred thousand dollars in the first month that got tripled by people like Dries and Vanessa and a whole bunch of in uh organizations uh, across the world but we can still continue to raise so there's still opportunity so that continues to the end of may and the reason we're doing that was because of drupalcon not existing in minneapolis we did eventually manage to uh, get out of the contracts there we've had to pivot and think what on earth are we going to do about getting people together instead of minneapolis and we came up with drupalcon global which will take place June, July 14th to the 17th. I'm sure you've read about it already. If you haven't, I want to introduce you now to our director of events and experiences. That's Carly Copra, who uh, has joined the call as well. So I'm just gonna give Carly a few moments to talk about DrupalCon before handing it back to me, if that's okay. Are you there, Carly? Yeah, hi everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, I was pretty excited when Rachel let me know about the meetup and included me um, to kind of speak a little bit about DrupalCon Global. So as you've hopefully seen with our announcements, we're really excited. Again, this opportunity to pivot to a virtual event. Um, sad about not meeting in person because there's so much value in everybody getting together and the hallway track and just the fun in the community feel of being at in-person events. But with the move to the virtual event, we're really gonna have an opportunity to have a truly global experience and increase accessibility for people all over the world. And so that's one of our features that we're really excited about is looking at you know, representation from almost all the continents. Um, and Rachel and I were joking that Antarctica excluded, um, but you know, basically everyone else. And the biggest piece that we're really focusing on with DrupalCon Global is that it's not just an extended webinar. And so we're working and we're fine tuning the program and revisiting kind of what was planned for Minneapolis to include all of those opportunities for speakers and presenters, but also how can we refresh it and make it more interactive and really include those opportunities for people to get to know each other and replicate those hallway tracks and the interactive experience. So it's gonna be a lot of fun. It'll be different than what you might expect from a virtual event, which I think will also be um, really enjoyable. So registration is gonna open mid-May and tickets are gonna be $249. Um, and it will be an, over an extended time frame every day. It's not gonna be 24 hours, but there will be an on-demand library. So you can access content at any time. Um, but the live sessions will be held throughout the day so that people from all over the world can participate. So again, really looking forward to it, um, July 14th through the 17th, and I hope to see everybody online. Thanks, Carly. 
So moving on to a few other things, uh, obviously I get involved in community things and particularly things global. Now you're in New York, I'm in Norfolk, uh, in the UK, and there are lots of people all around the world. We use the concept of local associations and I work with a lot of local associations uh, in different countries around the world. There's actually 29 local associations in, in 27 different countries and five continents around the world that we work with. And some of the best you know, bits and pieces that we've seen in terms of promotional materials through things like uh, Promote Drupal come from that. So I, it's one of the things I do is work with those groups and, and uh, keep that working together. They've got a whole thing going on at the moment around translating pitch decks and all sorts of things. It's great to see. They will also be translating a lot of the things for the Drupal 9 launch, like press releases as well, uh, because Drupal exists in more than just English uh, and more than just my English as well as your English as well. <laughs> um, another thing that we have coming very, very soon that both people here have been working on, people at the Drupal Association have been working on, uh, and uh, and people around the world, is a proper events listing built right into Drupal.org. At last, it's nearly here. And this is gonna make a big difference to us being able to direct people to events such as this, yeah? Uh, so people who don't know that there is a Drupal NYC will be able to find you right on the Drupal.org website, which we hope will help a lot. Uh, another piece of piece of work that the community started um, is a replacement for the Getting Involved Guide. There's going to be a new contributor guide coming that instead of just being how should we say, documentation pages, will actually use the power of Drupal for a change to create a content model of the community. So we will be able to see all of the different roles that make the Drupal community work. So that could be a temporary role, like submitting a patch or reviewing a patch, or it could be a more permanent role or, or a long-term role like um, volunteering at an event or organize an event. It could be a permanent role like a, a mentoring lead, semi-permanent. Then each role will have a set of tasks attached to it. So you'll be able to see what tasks are involved. But crucially, it will have a set of skills attached to it. So you'll be able to go and see, ah, I've got this particular skill and you'll be able to do a search on the Drupal.org website to see, ah, these are all the roles that I could be fulfilling in the Drupal community because I know how to do this skill. Not only that, but you'll be able to say, I want to get better at or practice a skill such as public speaking or uh, teaching or mentoring and see all the roles that you could possibly be doing and how to get involved in those roles directly from the Drupal.org website and then contact the right people. So that's been, uh, the a lot of the code for that has been written in the community, ready to go on to Drupal.org. And one of your own members, who's also a member of the Drupal Association, Neil out there, hi Neil, um, is currently reviewing all that code that we're giving him uh, and hopefully turning it into something that we can put onto Drupal.org right now. So thank you, uh, Neil, because I keep giving you lots of work. I do apologize. Uh, Say so that, that's coming along. Um, we also have lots of people in the Drupal community and at the Drupal Association that have experience and have built up experience of doing things like giving out grants and all that type of stuff and working with grant things. So when we have opportunities to help others in the open source community, 
in the general open source community, we do that. So one of the things that I'm currently involved in because of my experience in doing assessment, assessment of grants and stuff like that, I'm involved in a thing called FOSS Responders. There is a website, FOSS Responders, F-O-S-S, -S, for free open source software, responders.com. And it's a whole bunch of open source projects that have got together and are looking to create a place where those who may be suffering from COVID-19 financial difficulties directly to a, due to uh, events being cancelled are able to try and get some help with covering those financial difficulties and some very big companies have given money into the pot to make that happen it's quite exciting really we've been helping with making that a solid process because a lot of the people that are involved don't know that because the Drupal Association have done that for years. We can take that experience with us. In fact, actually, uh, our old executive director, Megan Sanaki, is one of the people who's involved in that as well. Uh, so, yeah, we, we're busy doing lots of things at the moment. Um, and I just kind of wanted to say those, say I'm always willing to chat with people. I've been chatting with someone today in Belgium uh, from Solvay Business School and looking at how we can do better leadership training and stuff like that for people in the Drupal community. Maybe in the future, I've uh, been chatting to people in Europe about how we can better represent Europe in the Drupal community, et cetera, et cetera. I want to hear from you as well. I want to hear what's important in Drupal in New York. And, and that region. So please do find me on the Drupal Slack, Rachel underscore Norfolk, and say hello. Uh, but uh, yeah, I hope that's useful. Thanks so much, Rachel and Carly. Really appreciate uh, your input. Uh, while we've got uh, these fine folks from the DA and Rachel far, far away in, uh, in Norfolk, UK, very late for her, uh, does anybody have any uh, any questions? I'll ask a question to you then. I'll turn this around. So I don't know if you've noticed on drupal.org slash blog recently, I've been posting some short stories about different Drupal websites or Drupal tools that are helping with COVID-19. And I was actually last week doing one of these local meetups in Colorado. And by sheer coincidence, I was also the same day posting a story about the state of Colorado on their state website and how it's helping with COVID. And that's based on you on uh, Drupal. So what I feel I should do is really take away or someone after this meeting can come and tell me about a story of something happening with Drupal in New York City uh, or New York State rather and take that away. So if you think of anything, let me know afterwards and we'll get it up on drupal.org slash blog. Awesome. Anyone have anything off the top of their head? Drupal in use in New York State for COVID-19 relief, anyone? Thank you, everyone. All right. Thank you both. Really appreciate you taking the time to uh, join the Drupal NYC community for a monthly meetup. And uh, let me get my screen shared again here. All right. So for anyone who uh, joined us uh, since we started here, um, we are communicating on Drupal uh, NYC Slack, uh, which you can find at drupalnyc.org slash Slack. We would love to see you there um, getting in touch uh, with our offline community online. Um, and uh, thanks again to Rachel and Carly for uh, talking about uh, what the Drupal Association has been up to. Um, so we're going to move on to our next talk. Uh, we've got another lightning talk, and this one is... 
introducing Drupal Views UI by Eleanor Y. Eleanor, did I say your name correctly? Yes, thank you. Wonderful. All right, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen here and uh, hand it over to you. Okay. Can you see my presentation? Yes, we can. Hi, I'm Eleanor. Can you, I guess you can see me. Yeah. I'm Eleanor. I'm doing a quick talk on Drupal views. I'm from New York. I graduated from Mercy College. My research area is in e-commerce, web programming, and database management. I worked as a web programmer and an adjunct professor. I taught some classes in Microsoft Office, and I did some Drupal web development work on Drupal 7. And I'm learning about Drupal 8, currently work on Drupal 8. So my first topic is, what is a view? What is a, a view is a listing of content on a website, on Drupal, Drupal website. Drupal, it views, the views module is a contributed module in Drupal core and allows the administrator and site builders to create and manage the display list of contents. A view is, is like a, you create, when you create a view, you create a SQL query that is pulling data from a MySQL database and displaying in, de, in a desired format on your website. Drupal the view has different components on Drupal 7 and Drupal 8. And these components consist of a field, a relationship, filters, sort criteria, header, footer. And these components are equivalent to a SQL query of creating a query. So the field component is equivalent to the select statement, selecting a field using a SQL query select statement. A relationship is the equivalent of a join. And the type of filter is equivalent as the from statement in SQL query. And a where statement is equivalent to is setting a filter on the on a view. And order by is equivalent 
as a sort criteria. Sort criteria is equivalent to order by. Oh, the advantages of having a view on a website and custom coding. You can create your own custom view by using a custom module. Creating a custom module using PHP or using the views UI when you log into Drupal Administrator. The advantage of using the views UI is you don't you don't have to change the code and avoiding syntax errors. And you have different types of views you can choose from from the core, Drupal core, and less risk of losing any data. And you could reuse the features of your views on Drupal. And there's a documentation on drupal.org to help you with Drupal technical issues and questions on how to use views. The advantage of having a custom code, custom code or a custom module, you can optimize your query and you can control your presentation details. You can export your view into PHP to a custom module. And you, you could write your own code in simpler form with fewer lines of code. And have control over your data being fetched from your database. Well, different styles, there's different views that different styles to choose from. When you create a view, you can, you can display in a table, you can display in a grid, a teaser with pictures, you could display in a block, JSON output, in RSS feed, you can display in a cal as a calendar or a slideshow. Currently, there are 626,307 sites that's using the Drupal views module on the Drupal 7 version. Some examples of Drupal, some websites that's using Drupal views. I'll show you a quick example. Can you see this? Can you see? Yep, looking good. This is a sample of a website that uses a view. See the filter a view to show a list of news articles and it has filters, it shows the filters and a list of articles.
Here's another website. This is a, another example of website that uses views to display a list of user faculty profiles with the filters. and some references of Drupal, of Bude on Drupal.org, I use. And that's, that's it. That's my presentation. Awesome. Thank you, Eleanor. Um, does anybody have any questions for Eleanor about um, an overview of views in Drupal? To the, the views. And I may actually steal that next time I uh, I teach that that in Drupal. But that's a really good way of presenting it. Agreed. Anyone else out there with uh, questions or comments? Okay. Well, was that worth coming? Thanks. Sorry, that was great. Yeah. <laughs> Appreciate it. It's a very good presentation. All right. Thank you, Eleanor. All right, so we're going to move on. I'm going to share my screen again here. And want to give a, another uh, big thank you to Eleanor for uh, talking about Drupal Views UI. Um, and next up, we have a longer presentation. This one's from Matt Glayman. He's talking about expanding the JSON API support in Drupal Commerce. So take it away, Matt. All right. Give me one second. I got to pick up my standing desk. I can't sit and talk. I'm a mover. All right. Let's see if I can get this. I hear you. Let's see if I can get this shared up. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so you, can you see my slides? Yep, looking good. Okay, I got to find out what it did with my presenter notes, though. Oh, there it is. All right, this is much better than at MidCamp. MidCamp, I tried to use Keynote, and it just, it was not a very successful adventure. Uh, Google Slides has made this very easy. All right. <laughs> So I'm going to talk about expanding JSON API support in Drupal Commons. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Mike Laman. I am product lead at Centaro. And for those who don't know who Centaro is, we are commerce guys, but we went through a rebranding. And Centaro is our new name. And Centaro aims to power e-commerce innovation through every stage of growth. And you'll kind of see that mission in this slide as we took the took JSON API and really helped it extend its support inside Drupal Commerce. So when we think about Drupal Commerce, most of our users start out running Drupal in a full stack. And when I mean full stack, it's you install Drupal. When you go to a page, Drupal does a database query and then pushes it through its render system, goes through Twig, and you get HTML. Regular old Drupal. That is what we mean by full stack. However, many reach a point where growth demands um, force them to move into a decoupled application, which we've heard everybody's talking about decoupled. That's when your back end is, is separated from your front end, the presentation layer. Um, one of the reasons that people hit this is usually for performance and customer experiences. So Drupal's render system is actually the most expensive part of the performance impl implement, uh, performance problems in Drupal, which is why it's great that we have so much caching. 
you know, they're on page cache and you're good for a content site. But once you're in a Drupal Commerce site and there's a lot of authenticated traffic, you start to have more cache misses. Um, we have a site that has 120 stores. So every product you view has 120 different cache entries. So the more the cache cardinalities you have, things can start to get a little bit slower. Um, another reason to decouple is we live in a world where people want reactive and unique customer experiences. And that's just easier to do in JavaScript. Like hands down, you build a snappy, fast interface using JavaScript. Um, there's also a business reason to decouple. You want your marketing team to have full control over the presentation layer. Um, I think we've all been there where we've had to like disrupt a, a sprint because marketing needed a hot fix to change some kind of style on the website, which threw apart your whole backend development flow. Um, so that's why I like decoupling because marketing can have their fix and then it completely separates concerns. Um, and a side effect of decoupling is it does provide a normalized way to expose your data to other business systems. Um, I've always considered Drupal Commerce to be decoupled because every site I've built talks to an external system, but it's always some kind of custom bespoke way. So if you build a decoupled application, you can try to normalize your data. Over the past two years, maybe three, uh, we've been working very hard at a adding API first capabilities to Drupal Commerce. API first is a term you've probably heard. There was a core initiative around it, which is what inspired us to make sure we had an API first ready Drupal Commerce. So what this really did is just ensure that the data model and all the things that make it work act the same way when you take away Drupal's rendering system. That was my takeaway from it. And actually, once we did that and we started to work with building an HTTP API, we found some bugs in our cart access that, you know, Drupal's render system protected us from. But once we got all that aspect, there was a few problems there. Um, coupon validation as a constraint. And then also through our API work, we were able to get um, the Drupal Commerce Availability Manager, aka Stock to work with the added cart form. It was one of those big to-dos, but once we solved it at like a data layer level, it works now with the API and also regular full stack um, Drupal sites. And I have a link that that's shared at the end that kind of explains how all of our API first and headless development has actually improved Drupal commerce along the way. So we're not leaving you know, the normal users behind. Uh, so that, Brings the question, and we sat down and asked ourselves, what should the HTTP API accomplish? One of the highlights and differentiators with Drupal Commerce is that it's multi tenant by default. And by multi tenant, it means you could have multiple stores. These stores could be individual physical locations, they could be multiple brands, they could be how you segment your markets. Um, and with that, you're able to get dynamic pricing based on those stores and their currencies. So the HTTP, the API needed to support all of that dynamic pricing. Um, we need to create a, car, a cart management layer. Um, you don't want your carts to be managed via the full entity, like create, update, and delete process. Because that means there's a lot of permissions involved. So there needs to be a lightweight cart management API layer. And of course, you want to collect shipping information because you're probably going to ship packages. That means you need to do shipping rate calculations, selection of a shipping rate, um, that whole intricate process, collect billing information and payment because you want to collect their money, and then completing said checkout so that way your order fulfillment process can carry off. So these are the parameters that we need to figure out that our HTTP API needed to accomplish. We first started out with the CART API module. Um, this provided a series of endpoints for cart management, and we built a complementary uh, cart flyout module that provided a progressively decoupled cart experience to kind of demo uh, the cart API. We built cart API with the RESTful web services module. When we first set out on this adventure, I think the JSON API module was brand new and just in the 1.x branch, and we only wanted to support things that were available in Drupal core. Commerce has a handful of dependencies as it is, and we don't want to add yet another thing. So we stuck with what was in core and created REST endpoint plugins. This allowed us to create a cart management layer. 
something that said, hey, I have this product, let me add it to the cart, but I can't edit other users' carts, I can't edit non-public fields such as, I can't say, hey, this is actually a placed order or fake payment on it. However, in doing so, we had to define our own request format and response format and create our own like API schema on what things should look like. And that involves writing custom data normalizers so that way you could, you could remove the Drupalisms, you know, field, array, value, then the actual value. Or what if you have the order and you always want to have order items available? It's kind of became a mess along the way. And so, like I said, it worked, but it wasn't flexible. I think the biggest, the biggest ask was always, I want to show images in my decoupled cart. Like, okay, well, you get the order and you have the order items, but then you need to get the product. Well, there's a way you could get the product, but images in Drupal are an entity reference. And also it was like, how do we, it wasn't built to just easily grab that. It became a blocker and that's when we realized like, okay, we need to find something better. Well, luckily something better was right around the corner. Um, and that was JSON API. Um, yes, we picked JSON API, not GraphQL. And that is a whole um, battlefield of arguments on which API you prefer. But I like RESTful APIs. GraphQL is not RESTful. And, and JSON API went into Drupal core. And like I said, we wound up, wanted to only pick things that were in core. As of Drupal 8.7, JSON API became part of core. So yay, um, this solved all, quite a bit of problems. So I would like to introduce the Commerce API module, which is our contrib that expands JSON API support for Drupal Commerce and essentially builds out the Drupal Commerce HTTP API. So there's a few things that JSON API immediately solved. Um, it provided a full entity CRUD system. Like JSON API takes Drupal's entity system and just spits it out as an HTTP API. It's great. With the RESTful module, you, there was no way to just say like, I want to get carts. You had to like edit a plugin using Drush because there's no UI. Ah, there's just not, not a good experience. JSON API solved that. Um, the JSON API spec provides a way to include referenced entities. So that whole problem about fetching images, hey, now you just use the include parameter. So you can actually just get back what you need. Um, and we didn't have to decide the mechanics of what our API should look at, should look like, because JSON API is a specification on what an API should look at, look like and operate. So that made our lives a lot easier. Um, there's a few things that didn't solve though, and caused some headaches. And I have been fighting with these headaches since the 2.x branch. Things have gotten better. They're not really headaches anymore. They're unblocked now that Drupal's in core. But probably the biggest roadblock for us is the fact that the JSON API module does not have a PHP API. As in, you can't create a JSON API resource as a plugin. You can't use hook alter to change how something works. It is a very locked down API implementation, which can be rough at times, but it's what allowed it to get into Drupal core so fast and made it such a stable implementation. Um, another problem, and the admin UI initiative ran into this, is that JSON API creates collections per bundle. So you got node slash article, node slash page. Makes sense when it's content, but what if you wanted to get all your products in your system? There was no way to just be like slash products. So if you had slash products, t-shirts and slash products books, you couldn't get all your books and t-shirts in one page. You had to have to make two requests. Um, as I said, the admin UI initiative had the same problem when trying to recreate slash admin content, like the content overview. So as of some of these, you know, these hiccups, we've been busy at work um, creating some things in the JSON API ecosystem. And I want to give a shout out to Gabe, Wim, and Mateo for dealing with me and all of my absurd questions and pestering. But as a result, we have created the JSON API cross bundle module, which lets you do slash node or slash product. 
The JSON API resources module is, I would say, the beginning of the PHP API. It lets you create custom resources and endpoints. So through the JSON API resources, we're able to create JSON API search API, which lets you expose your search API indexes through JSON API. Because most Drupal Commerce sites, well, all should be using search API and index-based um, catalogs. And then after building a few of the headless systems, like users need to be able to do registration and reset their password. So we then built the JSON API user resources module. All of these were kind of side effects as we built Commerce API and a fully headless e-commerce platform. So what does the Commerce API module provide? We talked about JSON API and all the other things that were created. Let's talk about Commerce API itself. The first thing that I like to highlight is it makes modifications to resource types. So JSON API just takes your Drupal data and like your architecture and just spits it out. Your, your entities are called nodes, or it's node dash dash page. In our case, it's commerce underscore product dash dash default, commerce underscore product underscore variation. It's not very friendly. It looks odd. Um, it's taking the concepts of Drupal and module namespacing and putting them into your API when they don't make sense. So when you use commerce API, all commerce entities have had their commerce prefix removed. So it is just product dash dash default. Um, all resource types use a plural, plural, pluralized format. So it's products slash default because most APIs that are out there use that kind of a format. And JSON API has always used um, an entity's UUID as the identifier. So we have removed the Drupal internal identifier field because we don't want any serial integers to be used um, because that makes it an API confusing if you have two versions to identify something. Um, one of the things added was specifying the current store. So as I brought up earlier, Drupal Commerce is multi-tenant by nature. So we've created the commerce hyphen current store header. And this allows you to pass a UUID that says, what is your current store? Um, if you don't pass one, the default store is used. But this is important because it ensures pricing and availability is respected when fetching products and adding items to the cart. Um, when you get to checkout, your store actually identifies what is your shippable countries, like what's the default currency code. So being able to specify this in your front end client helps you know, bring that all full circle. Uh, one thing we ran into was cart management. So we created a cart token system. So in normal Drupal Commerce, we use Drupal session management to store your cart data. That's how we know an anonymous user has a cart. We create a session for them. When you decouple, cookies don't exist. So you can't have PHP sessions. So our workaround was the Commerce Cart Token header. And you pass that with each request. And that way we know what orders belong to you. So essentially it's just a cart identifier. Um, the Commerce API doesn't generate that for you. Your front end client can generate a token. It could be anything you want, but once we receive it, we create a list of carts that are associated with different tokens. Uh, so cart management. So when by moving the JSON API, everything kind of stayed the same from cart API it just now uses JSON API formatting. Um, you can get the, the carts that belong to a user. You can add a product to a cart, update. One of, the one of the biggest benefits was the fact that the include parameter allows you to receive the updated cart object. So before, when you added something to the cart, you received like the new order item, and then you had to go refetch your cart. Thanks to JSON API's includes, you can actually get back that updated cart object. So you can make one request and get back the created order item and the updated cart for a much faster uh, interface. And our current production client, once we figured that out, it saved about um, 80 milliseconds, which seems fast. But when somebody adds something to the cart and they wait for that network request and then for React to re-render the cart component, it was kind of sluggish. But now it's instant. Here's an example of add to cart. We reuse the JSON API 
um, relationship document. So you post that, you specify the quantity and the meta property. Um, the cart, a cart will be created for one reuse for you. So you don't have to worry about cart creation. It just happens. And if you put a quantity that breaks stock, it will actually return a 422 unprocessable entity response. So that way your front end client says, Hey, sorry, actually we can't add this to the cart for you right now. Modifying cart items is like patching and updating any other entity. Um, we've added protections that prevent somebody from changing what they've purchased. So that was one problem with the raw API is somebody could edit an order item and change what they purchased. So with the cart API, it restricts those uh, that access. Uh, checkout. This was the big. This is the big one that we worked on. So in reality, for Drupal Commerce, checkout is just a series of order updates that eventually leads to the order being placed. You know, you collect data and eventually you say, I have enough data, I can place the order. Um, the Commerce API provides a checkout endpoint where you can do a, an initial get request and that fires an event that allows you to initialize the order or do pre-flight checks. Okay, we're about to enter checkout, is everything okay? Or I'm gonna pre-select a payment gateway for this user. Um, you can do various patch requests, like updating an order as normal to eventually get to that state where you're able to check out. Currently, you cannot place an order through the API. Um, you're only able to do so by using an offsite payment gateway, such as PayPal. So how it works is you build the order, your front end calls PayPal, completes payment, and PayPal sends a webhook to Drupal Commerce that places the order for you. Um, we're working on Fleshing that out next. Um, I did some, we did some interesting work in Commerce API. So one problem we experienced is that addresses. We store addresses for billing and shipping information in a profile entity. And profile entities are referenced by the order or in shipping, they're ordered by the, they're referenced by the shipment. So we were gonna end up asking people who implemented the API to create this profile entity, and then attach it to the order and ensure to update the profile when modifying the order. And that's, that's not very good user experience. So we created the order profile field that actually takes that profile entity and embeds it within the order. So if you need to update an address, you're actually updating it inside a field of the order. And we've removed that, we've abstracted that internal mechanism and Drupalisms of entity reference. Um, we did the same thing for the shipping method field. So in the commerce shipping module, you have an order that references the shipment, that references the shipping profile, and shipments have their rate. And there's just all these relationships, and that's really hard to try to force somebody to add into their front end client. So the shipping method field accomplishes that and ensures that you can set a shipping rate and that the shipments will have that rate applied to them, and you can edit it all in line of the main order object. Uh, we do have wishlist support. So wishlist worked by, you could fetch your wishlist, and Entity Access API did its job, but there was no way to add a product to a wishlist without adding all the internals. So we've added that. There's actually a few community members that have helped us push this forward beyond our first basic integration. So this is one area that's getting some good collaboration and will advance. We added some initial work for webhooks. Um, the current support example is marking an order as fulfilled. So if you're using shipping, an order could go from placed to awaiting fulfillment. And then you could, once it's awaiting fulfillment, it moves to completed. So this webhook lets your backend ERP system say, Here's the data I have, pushes it to Drupal Commerce, and you write custom code that subscribes to an event, and if everything goes well, the system will then take it from awaiting fulfillment to fulfilled. Um, and this is in production right now, being used by a client whose backend ERP says, all right, I received an order, their warehouse picks it, they press a button, it then pings the website, and the website um, pushes it through. So we'll be adding a few more of those as we decide like which ones do we add. Trying to be more specific than just, there's tons of things, let's add all the things. Um, 
being trying to spend our time and architect a good solution. So on the horizon, as I said, on-site payment gateways. And when I say on-site payment gateways, I, I mean things like Stripe and Braintree, where you're used to like entering your credit card information on the page versus a redirect like PayPal. Um, additional webhook support. Um, we're working on an embedded checkout support. So what this means is you built your, let's say your JavaScript front end and you built your cart, but you really don't want to build a checkout. So what you can do is you can take an iframe and reference your Drupal Commerce site and do checkout via an iframe. Um, a lot of like Klarna is an example of a payment gateway that does iframe checkout. Um, Zora, a subscription-based system, uses that too. So you could build your own iframe checkout with Drupal Commerce this way. And there's one more thing on the horizon. I wanted to bring up some Tarot Commerce. So as I said, we're building a headless commerce platform and it goes by the name of Centaro Commerce. And when I mention it here, it is a managed platform that we run as an open SaaS. So if you're not familiar with the term open SaaS, think of open social, right? There's the Drupal distribution and then they sell a managed version of it. That's, that's basically what we'll be doing as well. Um, we'll be offering a managed version of this that people can subscribe to or you'll be able to build it on your own like any other Drupal distribution. And that's what's driving forward a lot of this innovation and development. <clears throat> Sorry. So here's a few resources that will be available when I share the, share the slides. The initial blog post announcement about the JSON API, um, or the Commerce API module. Um, a series of API first blogs I've written on the Centaro site that explain this journey. Um, also linked to the Commerce API documentation. That was a blocker to releasing, is making sure we at least had, not full, but it explains all the nuances of the module and ways to use it. And also linked to Dries' announcement about JSON API in Drupal core. I think that was a huge, huge game changer for Drupal itself. All right. So I can take some questions, but before I do that, I wanted to say that you can find us in the Drupal Slack. There is the Commerce channel, which is the most active and largest channel in Drupal Slack. On Tuesdays and Thursdays, we host office hours twice. Um, we hold, hold them at like 11 a.m. Central Eastern Standard European time, and also at 11 a.m. Central. Um, I have a link to that blog post. And you can always email me at, at centaro.io or find me in Drupal Slack with questions. So if anybody has questions, I'm here to answer them. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Matt. Um, who's got some questions for Matt? Hey, Matt, it's Jake. I got a, a, a question about, yeah. in, in developing this, is there any, like, I'm going to use the word proof of concept, but more like, you know, the idea is you build these APIs so that anyone can use them, but at the same time, you need a proof of concept that these APIs are working and maybe setting something up with, you know, uh, I don't know what we would call it these days, like a starter kit or a front end starter kit for building a headless commerce card or, you know, yes. I don't know. If it's, yeah. So um, I forgot to mention that. So I just linked in the meetup channel. There is a demo front end. And last week, I think it was last week, I released a JavaScript SDK for interacting with the Commerce API. And the demo I linked to is a create React app, React app demo. And eventually that will be open source and kind of be like a starter kit front end. So you would be able to take the distributions, which we're going to release as well, and take the distribution that front end, you could run it yourself, or then you could say, hey, Centaro, I don't want to pay for the, I don't want to manage the back end. Here, I'll build our front end. Um, does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah, I'm clicking through. It's really cool. It's very specific. Yeah, yeah. Um, we're a little delayed because I was sick for the past five weeks, and that kind of like threw off our timeline. Uh, so I wanted to have a lot of this ready and released, but I was out sick, but we're back on that train. Thank you. All right, last call for questions. Oh. 
Simona's got lots of questions, but they're not about this. All right. Thank you very much, Matt. Really appreciate you uh, telling us about Commerce API uh, and all the JSON API work in Commerce. Oh. Thanks, Matt. OK. So with Ramona in arms here, I'm a little constrained, and I can't really easily share my deck. But I can tell you <laughs> that next up, we have Elijah Lin, um, who's going to be uh, giving our second longer talk today uh, about debugging with HTTP Toolkit. Elijah, how are you there? Hello. Thank you. You hear me all? <laughs> Ramona says yes. Off to you. Thank all you. All right. <laughs> nice. Hey, everybody. I'm out here. Uh, I'm out here in Portland, Oregon, and um, I used to be part of the Drupal NYC community. Uh, that was that was the start of my career. It was gosh, that was like four or five years. I think I started out in Drupal One NYC, uh, and um, yeah. Good to, good to be back, I guess, uh, virtually here like this. Um, all right, so I'm going to share my I share my slides in Slack just now. Um, so if anybody wants to follow along as you can, I'm going to be kind of updating them probably as, as we go along. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen. Let's see, present now my entire screen. Actually, let me close one. Oh, no, I can keep that open. Entire screen. Do you see the screen, to my, the example domain to my left, everyone? Looking good. All righty. All right. Um, OK, I'm just going to go through this up here. This is the same slide that posted. Uh, I'll do a quick background real quick. So I just want to share a little, like kind of a little story. Uh, back in 2012, I left my job. I was working for a, a well-known nutritional MD, uh, Dr. Furman, and uh, did some Drupal stuff uh, with Civic Actions and Lullabot with them. I was kind of like the in-house Drupal advocate. And um, at some point, uh, I really wanted to get more into Drupal. And... Um, I, they didn't. They didn't have that in mind. So, um, and I really wanted to go to DrupalCon that year. I, I had gone to the previous two in uh, San Francisco in 2010, and forgot what 2011 was. Maybe Chicago, I think. Um, and I want to go to 2012. I think it was Denver. Um, and I, um, they they didn't want me to go, and I couldn't take off, so I I, I quit. <laughs> I was like, so I was going to be a freelance, freelance developer. And I, I was just starting out. I taught myself programming on, on build the module.com and, and, um, lynda.com and some other online courses and stuff like that. And no, I was just learning. I taught myself Git first, actually, but, um, nobody would hire me. I contacted a lot of people. I say, you know, I'm new. I'm learning. Nobody hired. So I, I did, uh, some freelance stuff. Didn't, make a lot of money, racked up a lot of credit card debt. And um, and then I was giving a talk at a Drupal, uh, Drupal camp. No, no, no. The Drupal New Jersey group uh, at Princeton University on SAS. And uh, this is how my whole career started. Uh, and I, I, I learned about um, SAS and, and um, there was a recruiter in the office and they're like, before I even finished my presentation, they had emailed me, um, and they asked me if I wanted to work at NBC Universal. Oh, there's Alex! Look at that. <laughs> hey, Alex. I, and, I'm, the, um, I'm the fool that ultimately hired him. He, yes, he is. And um, and uh, your son Henry got a shout out in the beginning when you were here. By the way, I remember I remembered his name. Um, and um, and. I didn't, I was like, no, I don't, I don't want to work in New York City. They said, oh, you don't have to work in New York City and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, how recruiters are a little bit misleading sometimes. Um, so anyways, I ended up working for NBC Universal. I interviewed with Mr. Alex Ross here. And, um, and you know, I was, I was, I, had, I 
learned PHP that year and Git and all the stuff. And, um, and, um, and then I spent the next four years at NBC Universal and, um, it was just a fantastic learning experience. Got to work on some great stuff during that process. Um, I got to work on some high level, um, CDN caching things, varnish caching, uh, a lot of things to do with HTTP and how that all worked. And the reason I got to do that is because, um, I was at a nice can, uh, what is it? What was it called? Drupal. It was, forget the difference. It was either nice camp or the Drupal NYC camp. Um, and Fabian Patentier, if anybody knows who he is, he's the, uh, the creator and maintainer of Symphony, the library that we all use in Drupal 8 now. And, um, he gave a talk and I was sitting in the, the, uh, the talk. It was a big auditorium. And he's talking like, he's like, every developer should know HTTP. It should read the specification, actually. He recommended, and uh, I took that to heart. So, and then my commute to, to New York City and back, um, if you can see my screen at all, there's uh, this book here called HTTP, The Definitive Guide. Um, I actually read this. This is a thousand page book. <laughs> I actually read this back and forth on the train every day to New York City from my two hour each way commute sometimes. Um, and I learned HTTP and I read the whole, pretty much the whole specification because that book kind of breaks it all down. So, um, anyways, I have a, a, like a lot of, a lot of time spent into the HTTP world and, and I don't know if everybody needs to do that much, but I did. Um, and I've, I've gotten to do some cool things like work with, with Alex and NBC Universal, um, and do Akamai caching and varnishy things and all that stuff. Um, and um so that's that's kind of uh how that all started actually and that's because of the Drupal NYC meetup and um and before 2012 I actually went to a meetup at uh one of the meetups at World Trade Center number 7 I forgot what the name of the what was the name of the the company anybody remember that that hosted that that was um it was a magazine um Man Suedo Digital Mansueto. 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 They own Inc. Yeah. Inc. That's the company. company. Yeah. Yeah. And so I remember going there the first time before I had quit my job to, to do Drupal and things like that. And uh, I remember like just, it was like way over my head. It was like, it was really just like, I understood like 10% of what people were saying. Um, and then gradually I kept coming and coming and, and then it became you know, closer to 50%. And, 60, and I still, I still don't understand everything everybody says. And maybe I'm like 80% now or something like that. But I just want to give some hope out there to anybody watching. Like that was like how it all started. And I just read a lot and watched a lot of videos and listened to a ton of podcasts and stuff like that. So, um, and, um, yeah. And I was part of the Drupal, Drupal New Jersey, um, the community as well. And uh, then we moved out here, uh, and um, and then uh, ended up working remotely at Red Hat because of things, and got to do some DevOpsy things, and ended up doing some of the skills I'm going to talk about right now at Red Hat. And this was ultimately arrived at this new tool called HTTP Toolkit. Um, so, um, and oh yeah, my third career. Yeah, I, I I was a locksmith before this, actually. I <laughs> so, but I want to say I, I put that on here because I. I want to say I've noticed a parallel in people that are locksmiths and software engineers, and I think they're transferable. If anybody here wants to become a locksmith, it's like the same kind of, you're having to solve new problems every day, like picking a lock or figure something out or fix a lock or something like that. If you ever want to switch careers to more like mechanical things, you could you could probably do that in parallel pretty nicely. Um, you have the mind for it if you're, if you're kind of digging what you're doing now. Um, so. Anyways, all right, so that was long background, but I thought it was fun to share. Um, all right, so I had done some interesting stuff at Red Hat. Um, this is another story, pre-story. Um, I was like, I had to actually like install TCP dump on a server and I had to pipe the server real time over an SSH connection to Wireshark. And then I had to realize Oh yeah, here's the story. Here, I'll tell the story real quick. So we had redhat.com was on four webheads and 
uh, the site was throwing out some weird error every now and then. It was a flicker, we call them. Um, very inconsistent. And it was like a stack, you know, it was, a, it was basically a stack overflow happening. Um, and we couldn't figure out what was going on. The, the, the error is like an application level error, you know, they just act, uh, Apache or something like that. And, um, I finally went into the server. It was talking about like, uh, you know, DNS. It was like a DNS error looking up, couldn't find a DNS. And I went into the server and I, I piped down and I realized using Wireshark, you can look at DNS unencrypted over the, over the, you know, the packets. Um, and I realized there was no DNS request being made at all. Um, and that led me to then ultimately find out that our ops people had installed a rolling update and updated glibc um, without restarting the servers. So we had like the HTTP server was actually like half in memory and half using a new glibc. <laughs> it's like some really crazy deep issue. Anyway, I figured it out and we yelled at the ops team not to do that anymore. Um, and they did it, kept doing it anyways. But um, anyways, we, that was, so that was like just debugging HTTP and looking at stuff, really valuable tool. And I, I do urge you guys to, to, to learn that kind of stuff. Um, you may not have that role, so it's not, right, right, not particularly up your alley. But um, anyways, this, this is kind of very similar. And what I'm about to show you, and um, and really, um, I'll go to this next story now. This is what actually was applicable to Drupal and in kind of uh, and our you know our application level uh, day jobs that we kind of um, um, do in a day to day basis. All right, so um, I was working on uh, the. The site I'm working at now, which is an open, uh, by the way, I'll plug this. It's an open source, um, an open source government website, uh, va.gov. Um, the entire front end is decoupled and static site. Um, it's, um, it's on GitHub. You can actually go look at it. Um, and the back end is, is behind like a, v, uh, a firewall, but it's also open source. Um, and it's Drupal 8. Um, actually work, uh, worked with John. John Pugh on the call uh, on the VA.gov project and also Robbie Holmes. Uh, Robbie Holmes is kind of like the, I don't, I don't know if you're the architect, Robbie, but you know, you're definitely a lead on that project. I, I came in late. I passed the stage of, of that. Um, but anyways, working on this project and the way the website is built and you, you kind of make a graph, you, you make a GraphQL request to the Drupal backend and you build the site and it gets all the data from GraphQL and it, it builds the site. But we are seeing like this really random error and with the node, the node fetch function. And it wasn't a, it was like, just didn't make sense at all. Um, so I finally figured out, um, that, um, I could use this one tool here, HTTP toolkit. Um, to actually inspect, oh, am I even getting, it's like, it said something about the response and it was like not having data in it and it was a bad error message. And I think we ended up fixing that. But um, I was able to use this tool and see, oh, there is data in it. And it was like invalid JSON or something like that. Um, and I was like, nope, it's valid JSON and all the braces are there, the, the commas are right, you know, and everything. It was like, it was like a five megabyte JSON response but it was there. Um, and that led us to the next step. You know, whenever you're debugging something, I was looking for the next step. How was the next step? What's the next step? Cause you never, you, if you think too far ahead, you won't figure it out. But as long as there's a next step, you're, you're good to go. Um, so, um, and then I was able to take this tool and actually put new data into it. Cause you can pause your, these requests and you can just pause them and you can then, send new data and I could put a bad response in there um, if I wanted to. Um, and I can also intercept the response and not have it take 60 seconds. You know, I can just pop something in there if I already have the response and, and test stuff out. So it was really powerful. Um, anyways, this tool is relatively new. It was announced on Hacker News maybe a year or two ago. And it's 
it's really just a pleasure a pleasure to use. It's not many tools or if anything like it besides Wireshark is close, and I'll demo that in just a second. But um, um, first, I want to do a little bit of like a, an overview on uh, HTTP. Um, so, like, I just want to ask the question: like, how many? I can't really see the grid actually on this. This might not work as I was looking for a show of hands since I'm presenting, and everybody's probably on mute. But um, I'll just skip that part, that question then. Um, I was going to ask, like, how many people are familiar with HTTP, and is it valuable to go over this? So we have we have thirty or so people on the call, so I'll just touch base on HTTP real quick. Um, so HTTP, I'll just do a brief overview of HTTP real quick before we get into this for the people that may, you know, this is kind of advanced. So I'm going to try to try to get some of the people um, that aren't unfamiliar with this up to speed a little bit. Um, so this basically everything on the internet works over. Um, I, the internet protocol, which is IP. Um, and then, and there's like these layers. So you have internet protocol, and then on top of that, you have this thing called TCP and um, UDP. Um, and they're all, so every time you make a request anywhere, it sends these little, these little packages of data. And um, it's, it's con this constant back and forth chatter. Of like, did you? Get, I sent this. Did you get it? Yes, I got it. Send me the next one. Did you get it? Yep, got it. And then all this stuff, right? So that's what you know. So TCP does that. The TCP is like, I sent you this. Did you get it? And the other one's like, yeah, I got it. Send me another one. And it just keeps doing that over and over and again. Um, so that all works over. So an IP, the layer below that is like a phone book. You know, you can look up your friend's name in the phone book and then you have their phone number and you don't have to look it up again. You have the number. Um, and that's how um, DNS works as well. Um, but so TCP and so, so I just want to distinguish this real quick. So TCP and UDP are two different things. Um, UDP is what people use for like video. Call. Like what the video call we're on right now is using UDP. And because if it loses any packets, it doesn't matter. Uh, it doesn't matter if you get those later. It, what matters is right now. So just just know that TCP and UDP are, are everything that the internet works on. Um, real time communications uh, with UDP and TCP is where it actually matters that you get the text like in the exact right order, uh, and, and it matters. You know, so anyways, HTTP, what we all use for the internet now, is built on top of TCP because remember every byte matters. Um, if you lose data when you're trying to load a website, it's not going to load right. Your CSS is going to be missing. You know, it's, it's, your JavaScript is going to be missing. So everything runs on TCP. Now, there is like a new thing called HTTP3, which is HTTP over UDP, but that's, I'm not going to get into that right now. Um, so then we have HTTP. Um, and um, I'll, let me pause real quick. Does anybody have any questions on that so far? Because I, I know how like, if you don't ask a question right now, you you won't be able to grasp the rest of this. Give you a second. Elijah, I'm if I wonder if you could make your screen your um, display bigger. Oh, it's hard to read. Yeah, there we go. Thanks. Yeah, is that bad? Is that bad? No, it's not. So you yes. have a voice. No, of a, yeah, it is. Oh, hey Beth, <laughs> how's it going? Hey Elijah. Beth, Beth is on the va.gov project as well with me. So thanks. Um, all right. Um, um, okay. So on, now we have HTTP. And so everything with HTTP, whenever we load a web page at all, uh, is made of requests and responses. I request something from the IP address and um, I get a response. It's, it's the same thing all the time. It's just request, respond, request, respond. Um, the way we we do that is with these things called methods. So HTTP methods, you've probably heard that term before. There's only two methods that browsers use. Um, there's about seven or eight of them, I think. But the only two ones that browsers use are get and post. Um, and they're not called verbs, by the way. Um, the other people use that, but the specification doesn't say that anywhere. So, fun fact. Um, as I read it, remember. <laughs> uh, get and post. Um, so uh, a get is where you just go go get something, and um, 
and you, that's where you can have query parameters on there, and you can have, I think you can have query parameters on post, but usually as a post, it's a little bit different. You you post to a, uh, a URL, and you also have a post body that comes. Uh, you send to it as well. So the what browsers use, there are other methods like delete and patch and head and options and things like that, but the browsers don't use those. So anytime you're in a, in a browser scenario, you're only going to see a get or post um, request. Um, and those are always in the request header. So, so all the requests and all the responses are made up of headers. Um, and then there's a request body and a response uh, body as well. So um, a request body is only used when you're doing a post request. Um, so hopefully you're tracking a little bit here. Um, now in the specification, you can have specific headers that are defined, like um, cache control is a specification header, um, things like that. Um, um, location, if you're getting a redirect, is a, is a, if you're getting a redirect response, you're getting a location header saying where to redirect to. Um, then you can also have custom headers, very useful custom headers. Um, we set up on some um, sites that have multiple caching layers, like uh, Akamai and Varnish. Um, actually set up custom headers so we can analyze them like um, bypass Akamai true. And then you can also pass a bypass varnish true. You have to set up your your Akamai and your varnish to be able to skip those. And then that way you can test out each layer of your caching. Um, really fantastic implementation of custom headers right there. But there's all sorts of custom headers. So, so sometimes you'll see custom headers in your responses. Um, you can also turn on like in Akamai, you can actually send a, a specific header that's not in the specification to Akamai, and they'll actually send you back a whole bunch of debug headers. Um, and uh, we might be able to demo that if we have time. But, um, you know, uh, there's a lot of good resources on the headers, but I want to highlight these two because it's really confusing when you're looking at all the headers. And I'm just going gonna, gonna to jump out here. How can I make just one side big here? So I'll just want to show the browser a little bit of a demo right now. Um, so here's, um, can I break this out? Yeah. So this is a uh, network tools and um, I made a request to example.com and this is like an official example.com website that, that we all are supposed to use for example URLs. So I'm using it. Um, here, I'm just gonna break this down real quick. I'll make this a little bit bigger. Um, I made one request and it didn't send back any like JavaScript URLs to parse, so it, it, you only see one here actually. So it's, it's pretty straightforward. Um, we we requested this right here, example.com. Um, we got a response at 304. It's a response code from the HTTP specification. Uh, but then the way here is say we response headers, or we request headers. Um, so the request actually happened first, so it's a little bit out of order here. But um, I requested this information here. And um, and these are all the headers. Uh, and then the response headers um, are all right here. And then the response body is actually right here in this third tab right here. Now you can see the response body. So we got all that data right there. Um, it's a preview. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, anyways, um, we have a date, e tag. We have all these all these headers, and these are all according to spec. Now, Fastly is like I've yet to be on a project where I get to use Fastly yet, but they're the they're the they're the most modern, advanced CDN um, out there, um, and they actually have Drupal eight uh, instant purge, like perfectly built in. It maps the Drupal eight cache tags, so you, you can actually just like use those cache tags. I think Wim Leers helped build the Fastly integration module and can actually just keep your content perfectly purged in Fastly, and I think it's like under a second, like global pack, pack, cache purge as well. So if you're not using like a static site or something like that, you know, Fastly is a great CDN. And they did draw, they sponsored the Drupal meetup for, um, well, I, I don't know if they're still, are they still sponsoring it? I don't know. Anyways, um, they were sponsoring like the happy hour and stuff like that. Um, they are not sponsoring it right now, but they are giving uh, Drupal.org a very good deal. Yeah, yeah, nice. Yeah, that, that's right. The Drupal.org runs on Fastly as well. Um, so, but anyway, they have some really great technical information on their website. And um, this is a, like a, little, a little cheat sheet um, here. 
So it's called the headers we don't want. So like you're looking at this stuff and you're looking at all these headers and some of it's confusing because you have like this one that confused me for a while. I'll just show it to you real quick. Uh, pragma. Let's see, pragma. Pragma is like, there's like some sites that have pragma headers in them and like none of the, nobody uses those anymore. They're not actually used. And I didn't even know that till I like read through enough of the HTTP book and all that stuff. So this is like a little cheat sheet you can use to see like a little, it, it takes a while to amass all the knowledge of all these headers and stuff like that. So don't, it's pretty overwhelming. So just know that that's normal. <laughs> um, and like Xcache, you might think that that's important. If you see it here, it's not actually needed. Um, it's probably useful because like um, you'll see in the back end um, if that was you know useful. But um, um, anyway, so there's the headers we don't want by Fastly. And then there's also um, the, the headers we do want. Um, and it talks a little bit about that. So I'm not going to go too deep into that. I just wanted to share that because of that. Um, and um, all right, so let's see. Where am I here? Can I just hit the F button or the F11? That works. Um, Mozilla also has really good um, information. Um, so that's kind of how HTTP works in TCP and stuff like that. Um, it gets a little bit here. So now let's do another little live demo here. And um, let's see here. So the traditional way I used to try to suss out things going on in the network was do uh, Wireshark. And this is a, a UI tool that can monitor your network traffic. So um, so if I, I stop logging there, let's see, I'm going to clear here. We'll see it clear this filter out here. This is a tool you can download it. It's free. It's open source, and um, and it does a lot of different protocols, not just TCP and UDP. You can like you can sniff your USB mount your devices and stuff like that. I think um, most of the traffic we're seeing here is on my Ethernet interface, so we're only going to see protocols that go over Ethernet um, and, and the internet and stuff like that. So um, you know, you can see we have a lot of UDP stuff here. Guess what all the UDP stuff is? It is my video stream to you all and yours to me. Um, ICMP, let's see. So I'm not going to go too deep into that. But what I do want to show is um, how I used to kind of look at things until HTTPS became everywhere. <laughs> and I'll, I'll go into that in a second. So um, let's see here. Where's my demo here? Um, so this is example.com is actually one of the few sites that's not upgraded to HTTPS everywhere. So I can show this. Um, and let's see here, I'm going to just um, dig example.com real quick. Let's see if the IP is on the load balancer. It's not. So let's see. IP address. And I can do IP.host um, matches. And here we go. Um, so this is this is a little bit rough. You don't have to know exactly what's going on here, but you can you can see the whole stack of how this works. Like this is kind of interesting. If you can see this, it's a little small, but everything starts at my Ethernet, and then it goes over the IP, and then this is another layer on top of that, which is the TCP, and then on top of that is HTTP, Hypertext Championship Protocol. So you can actually learn a little bit about how this all works. There's there's MAC addresses for like good way the destination IP is like on a good way like you know it's really interesting stuff um, so uh, here's an HTTP um, request and you can actually see the get there's a little arrow there and then a response so I did the get and you can see here I did a get and this should match up perfectly actually if you want to look here um, uh, Where's the other get? So there's another get right here. It's a 304. What we we requested here, uh, we even have some response headers in here. I'm sorry, request headers in here. Um, this is uh, so if none match right here. So request header if none match. There we go. 314 gzip. It matches exactly. And then um, and then we can look at the, the response not modified. And we see this not modified code right here. Um, and we see not modified 
right, right there. And that all matches. Um, and then, um, you know, and then, so, so Wireshark has this nice little feature where you can actually follow a stream. So you can actually piece together multiple. This was probably only one packet because it was so small, but, um, this, you can actually see the entire thing put right together, including the response body. Um, uh, actually, no, it actually, it shows the get and that shows response all together. So you don't have to look at each one individually. So that's because this is HTTP, not HTTPS. Um, once you start dealing with HTTPS, which I'll go to my website, um, and we can, we can go here. <coughs> Let's see if big Elijah. Make sure my AP is not changing. Oh, actually, that that this is the one that's changing. <clears throat> uh, six, seven. Uh, it's, it's changing quite a bit. But <clears throat> go to um, IP dot host matches. This is all setting up to show you why the value in HP toolkit is important here. One thirty-eight dot. Let's see if that goes there. Um, yeah. Um, let's see here. So it's not actually possible. You can follow this stream here, but this is just oh, this is a network status check. That's not the right one. Um, let me just reload this a few times. Let me see if I can hit that right IP address because this is behind, uh, not a great example. It's, it's changing. Um, IP dot host matches. One sixty five. Maybe this will work. Two two seven. That should be it. So now we can start to see this TLS version 1.2. So that's an actual layer in between TCP and HTTP. And once that happens, it, and you don't have the encryption certificates, you cannot actually decrypt it. So there, you'll see there's no HTTP here. I can, I can see that there's a TCP stream here, but I can't follow it. There's no HTTP stream to follow because it's HTTPS. And unless you have the actual um, certificate private key, you can't actually intercept this and you can actually load a private key in here and you can get the, you know, the data out and do that. But, you know, I don't have that. Um, so what HP toolkit does, I'll show you now. Now, let's see, so that's, that's a Wireshark. I'm going to close this out now, but you know, that's a, so Wireshark's great until you hit HTTPS and you're dealing with that. And then it just is like read only as well. Um, as far as what I know how to do at least. So, um, now I'll open up HTTP Toolkit. HTTP, I already have it open. Uh, did I just open a new version? Hmm. Now this is HTTP Toolkit. I'll just stop for a second. I've been going kind of fast. This intercepts HTTP. It it also intercepts HTTPS traffic. And I'm not going to go in too deep on how that works right now because that's it might just be unnecessarily confusing, but know that it does it. It's got a way to do it. And um, I can explain it to anybody if they want to know how. Um, and you can actually, it ships with pre-bundled Chrome and Firefox. And um, you can actually just launch a Chrome that's already set up to use its trusted certificate and it hijacks all the requests going through here. Um, it, it decrypts them. The right way, and then it re-encrypts them again. That's kind of like a man in the middle attack, um, but it's all good because you know you're you're doing it and whatnot. So, um, just now, just this is just like the Wireshark all comparative functionality right here. I'll show you first, um, so I can just request that. This is HTTPS. So actually, let's let's go to my website, ElijahLynn.net. Um, and we will go here. And now, guess what? We just looked at HTTPS traffic. Um, so it took care of all the complexity around decrypting all that stuff. Um, 
using this pre-bundled Chrome instance. And now we have um, uh, response. And um, actually, that was that. So body in here. There's the response body. Um, That's interesting. We should figure that out. Um, I saw a, re what's I saw that? a redirect. This one's not. So this one's a 304 not modified, and it should have a response body. Um, yeah. Um, let me just try it again real quick. So, Elijah. Nah. Let's clear that. Aborted connection in this one. Live demos, wonderful. Not even seeing the root request anymore. Uh, let me try a different one. Here, let's do this one here. Am I using, so here's a response body on this one. Um, this is like a demo URL that they have set up. Um, anyway, so as we can see HTTPS response right here. We don't have to like follow the stream or anything. It just puts everything together, puts it all in one place. Um, and we can see all the details, very similar to Chrome network tools. Um, and, um, but, so that's like, why would I use this? Uh, great, I could use Chrome network tools for that, right? Um, but what we can do here is, uh, sorry, I, I was a little fast, let me, let me, oh, you know, I know why it's not going again as a service worker on this site. Well, that's pretty interesting. Um, go back to view, um, close that, control shift reload, uh, that, now this should have a response body now. Yeah, there was a service worker, so the response body never came over HTTP because the service worker was serving it from a service worker cache. That's pretty pretty fun. Um, so now we can see that we actually did get something over the wire, and here it is right here. So now I can actually create a mock rule. It's a little hard to see, but it says create a mock rule from this exchange here, and it matches here. Um, I can then pause the response and manually edit it, right? So let me save that. Now, refresh. Oh, I have to, I have to do the uh, Control-Shift-R again. We're paused at a breakpoint. This is very similar to Xdebug, right? Um, so now we're paused at a breakpoint midstream. We hijacked the certificate. We hijacked the, the secure request, re-encrypted it back to this browser, and you can actually, just really quick, the certificate is actually now, is actually HTTP Toolkit certificate, not the one that uh, I, I used from Let's Encrypt. Um, it's very fascinating. Um, so now I can actually change the response headers if I want to. So can I actually get to the network over here? Um, um, I could change this to the cache control to private if I wanted to, see how that responds. Um, I can also just uh, say, your page belong to us, right? Um, and I'll resume. Let's see where to go. Oh, I didn't save it, I don't think. I'll try it. Oh, uh oh. I'm going to just do a stop and restart here. Okay, so let's just say. All your page belong to us. Actually, it looks like it's aborting the connection. That should still work. There we go. So we just hijacked and intercepted the response directly to the website. So we can also change the request if we want to. We can change the response. Um, it's really great for testing out headers. 
Um, so you can actually see, this is probably not a great idea to use with that because it's got a service worker and that's just going to complex things right now. Um, but I'm going to load this page here. And here we go, headers. And with the 200 OK, because it's not actually serving from cache, because it doesn't have an if, like a, an if modified since, or um, I don't know, what is it in here? Um, let's see here. What? Let's see here. What, what could I do real quick to, uh, Wikipedia has got caching. That's just, um, I think there's like a while, a feeling lucky in here somewhere. Um, featured like a featured article, yeah. So let's go to Macedonia, the ancient kingdom. And let's start, let's just filter this by doc real quick. We got a 304 not modified. Um, and then let's, let's serve it again. I'm trying to get it to show up in cache. And then I was trying. I was trying to show you how you can bust the cache out with these headers. Um, all right. Uh, I don't have that demo set up though. But let's see where I cache header control test. Oh yeah, that's we should figure that out. But um, console. Okay. I I know I've been talking for a long time. So um, I'm going to show you another thing you can do, and that is so that's great with the browser. You can intercept that response. But now intercept, you can actually launch a, uh, I use fish, so this doesn't work. I, I put in a request for this for the fish shell folks. Um, but um, I'm just use a fresh terminal right now. It'll launch a new terminal for you. And then if you go and, um, if you want to go and pause these breakpoints too, you can curl www.elijahlin.net. It's so HTTPS or paused again. So it actually works with command line too. So now we're actually doing the same thing the browser was and we can modify this and we can say curl time, okay? Uh, resume that and then we got a response that says curl time right here. Um, so incredibly powerful tool and, and um, uh, I can go like that, and I can change. I can even see. Was there one more thing we could do? We can actually, actually, change the mock rule, and and we don't. We don't actually pause the request, right? So let's not even. I mean, this is before the request has even left the computer now, and it's on its way to the website. Um, I could change the host name. Let's see, I could change, you know, uh, accept. Could change the user agent. I mean, uh, it's silly. You can put any user agent you want in there. I could put Elijah, um, and I could um, respond. Uh, respond. Uh, there's no request. The request body is not going to matter in here. I could change the method to a post. It gives a different. You can change the request methods. Um, you can do a lot of different things. Um, it's probably going to work out there. Yeah, it didn't didn't work because the server probably. Denied it. Anyways, um, let's see. Um, so I said I just put some potential use cases on here. Um, mock form submission posts. So like if you're if you're testing out a form, I'll make this bigger. If you're if you're testing out a form, um, and you keep you want to like you want to you want let's say you're trying to do some JavaScripty things in Drupal, right? And you're trying to change. You're gonna. You want to see what it's gonna look like, but you don't want to do all that work. You can actually just submit the form. Um, and if I have anything set up, I can do that right now. Um, but you got to. I mean, the, the the concept is the same. I don't have a demo set up for that right now. Um, but you can pause the form request, change the data in it, and then if if it works. And you're like, oh, that works right. Then you can do the work to go refactor Drupal's, um, you know, form handlers to go do this this thing where you have to nest a bunch of fields together or whatever. You can actually mock that data right in there, um, and that's really powerful. Um, 
You can test what your cache control headers are going to respond you know, with if you're changing those. Um, um, and then I'll show you one last demo here. Uh, also really neat if you're just sniffing out traffic. Um, here's, um, let's see, this is, actually, no, where's the, so if we launch a Chrome here, where is it? Here we go. This is pretty interesting, kind of scary. Not not scary, but whatever. This is the Wonder Bar in Chrome, right? The default Wonder Bar. If I start typing D, you'll see on the left, a request just went, autocomplete search went, an R went, a U, a P, an A, an L. Um, and you can see, you can see the client is trying to provide these suggestions. So here's the suggestions that was trying to come back with right here. Um, interestingly enough, it was like I was trying to show the demo because it was doing this very interesting thing where it was it was returning gifts, a little not animated gifts, but just gifts of like weird pictures. Totally like why is it returning a picture for an autocomplete search? Um, and um, anyways, that that's. You know, just more traffic. You can see all the traffic coming in on your system like that, um, and you get some some surprises there as well. You can only do that. Uh, you can do system traffic discovery. You can set up your um, your computer if you go here. Um, anything, so it gives you instructions on how to uh, set up your entire computer to shift traffic through this one proxy. Usually, you have a system proxy that you can set up in your operating system level, and um, you can do that. Um, and also existing terminal, sometimes it's a lot nicer to stay in your existing shell. So this just gives you some instructions. Um, you know, it, it it's, a, it's just a script right here. Um, and you can, like, here's my existing shell here. And that's not going to work because I'm using fish. But if I were to go to bash and then run that, it's, it's going to run this script. Um, and then if I curl, you know, HTTPS, www.elijahlin.net. Uh, it'll it'll pause and break point right here, so you can actually use that too. I it doesn't work so well if like Node is running like post Node install scripts. It's like nested stuff because the way it works is um it uh environment it actually sets a whole bunch of um let me just make this bigger. It sets like it just loads all these like it puts a whole bunch of like things like um basically two things, the proxy URL, and then also the uh, the, the certificate file, um, the certificate authority file. Um, all right. Um, that was longer than I thought it would be. Um, and more. Oh, there is one, one feature I'm going to show here, right? Uh, if you go to a response, you can actually export any request. And this is the same with, with Chrome, too, kind of. Um, and you can actually export these requests. This is kind of neat. Um, as here, so um, any like a lot of things, but curl is really useful. So I can export that as curl, copy the snippet, and then I can actually paste that into my. You know, I can actually actually now here's here's a breakpoint again, um, and resume. Um, you can actually get like what is PHP. Uh, what is a PHP like? It generates the curl for you to put in your lib, um, your lib, uh, your lib curl implementation in PHP. Um, and same with, with uh, uh, you know, Chrome Network Tools. Uh, you, you can um, um, let's see here. You can you can right click on any request in Chrome already and right click copy um, copy as curl um, as well. And this is really useful, especially if you have like a session. Uh, cookie that you're trying to like, like if you were trying to like, you're logged in and you want to see what that logged in user response is going to be like in curl and you want to maybe put it in a loop and run it a hundred times and do some performance testing or something like that. Um, that's really useful as well. Um, so, you know, just know that this copy as functionality is, is pretty useful. Um, and um, the Python code it generates. There we go. So, um, that's pretty much the gist of what it does right now. There are some uh, more features in here, like return response from a file. If you actually don't want to put in this, like you just like automatically want to like hijack this one path. 
that you're just like, maybe you're working on this one endpoint and you just want that endpoint to return something you're mocking up. That's pretty useful. I do believe that might be in the paid version. I have the paid version. I, I kind of don't remember what, what, um, thing is, but it is, um, it is a really just one of a kind tool right now. And, um, it's, uh, it's really just tremendously useful. Um, so timeout with no response. This is really good for testing. Like if you're writing code and you want to test an except you're throwing an exception. If it gets like a 500 response, right? How are you going to get a 500 response? You can mock it. You can mock through 500 response. It comes in, then you can actually test out your exception code. Uh, or what if it's timing out? How is your code going to handle a timeout? Uh, you can time out, um, time out with no response. Boom. Just times out. Um, so. All these things are, are just tremendous uh, tools here. All right, that was a lot of talking. Any questions? All right, thank you, Elijah. Any questions for Elijah? I'm taking over MC duties because uh, uh, JD's little girl, um, didn't. it didn't sit well with her, this whole interrupting HTTP requests, and she barfed all over. Oh, the yeah. Well, now it's me. Uh, so, uh, 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 an appropriate response. <laughs> exactly. Elijah, right. uh, have you ever ins watched the inspector when, when you looked at a Gatsby site? I did once. Gatsby. Yeah. It, so it so that 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 my site. There's so is much Gatsby cool stuff site. going on. You can as you scroll, it will like do requests and things. It's a fun demo if you ever want to ah. a live demo of like the inspector you were looking at while you type. Yeah. Um, but like. Gatsby is special because it does like a whole suite of things to make the experience feel fast. So like as yeah. you, you just hover over a link and it'll do like a prefetch type of thing. Okay. And so it's kind of an it, it's interesting. That would be it might be an interesting demo like to see all the things moving, all the moving parts. Yeah. Um, I have no, but I will say that site, my site is a Gatsby site and it was not doing a lot of that stuff because it's using a service worker. So I did it once and I used a really light version. Um, uh, so there's different like setups you can use with Gatsby. So there's different starter kits you can use with Gatsby. Um, anyways, um, no, but that's, that's good enough. All right. Did they, I, now I can see everybody's faces. Did anybody get anything out of it? Raise your hand if you got anything out of it. All right. Okay. I thought that was great. Nice. I want to say hi to Elijah with Ian from Purple Cow, New Jersey. Ian, we can't hear you. You're a little quiet. Hold on a second. We can hear you a little bit, but it's quiet. I don't know why not. You we heard you good the first time. Sorry, any better? No. <laughs> oh. <laughs> or you could just yell. We could probably hear it if you yelled really loudly and woke up your neighbors. Or Slack us with your question. Oh, that looks just like holding. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, holding. Hey, how's it going? Any, any other questions for Elijah? Comments, concerns, jokes, poems? <laughs> Hi, I'm this Al. Um, I wanted to ask if you find these tools useful for AJAX requests, and or is it a bit overkill for just using like the web inspectors for that? So AJAX, yeah, this would be good for AJAX requests as well. Um, if you want to, if you, if you just want to look at them and look at the response, then the, the network tools in Chrome is fine or Firefox is fine. Um, but if you want to actually change them or Pause them, or you know, change the response codes, or anything like that. Definitely a good, a good tool for this. Perfect tool for this. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. I know. I had a question. Quick. Like, I can go look in their docs after, but do they allow scripting any of this stuff? Like with HTTP toolkit. For like I think there might tool? be. I think there might be. Uh, I will say. Before, I'll just turn my. I'll just present one more, one more thing real quick. Um. Uh, let's see here, it's HTTP, so there's on the application, here it is. There's a send, can you get feedback here? And there's a um, issues, 
Um, the script. I thought it allows scripting a mock rule behavior. I thought I saw that. Uh, so it looks like then it looks like the, oh, this is the actual uh, author. Um, so he actually created this issue. Um, so it looks like this is the issue to follow. If you like, I'll post it in the Slack. Uh, it's not yeah. there yet. Yep. Um, it's not an open source tool, but wait, it says open. Wait, hold on. No, is it? Is it? Oh, wait, wait, wait. It's, it is. Look at that. The whole thing's open source. Nice. It's pay that pay you to get some new features to upgrade. I didn't know it was actually. I just, I just, I paid him money because uh, I want this tool to never die. <laughs> like this is, this is great. I just want you sure you can have my money and I'll pay you, you know, for it. Um, cause it's saved me so much time. All right. Um, that's cool. So I'll post this in Slack real quick here. Um, stop sharing. There we go. We're back to normality. And so the whole thing is built on Electron as well. Um, just so you all know. So it is kind of heavy as far as that goes, but um, it does work and it's, it's got a nice UI and it's pretty. So, well, I better than Wireshark. Woo. <laughs> I, no, no, knock the Wireshark and the developers there, but it's you know, it's just nice, what a nice modern tool for HTTP debugging. All right, all right. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Elijah Lynn. Welcome back to the New York City uh, Drupal Group. It's it's been it's been uh, a, a while since you've been here. But uh, I guess this, this can be the silver lining to our pandemic. There you go. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to present a Chrome tab. And it's going to be this Google slide. And I'm going to share. Everyone can see that, hopefully. Yep, it's loading. Yep, yep. There we go. It's loading. It's showing. We're good. Yes? Yes, we did. Yeah, yeah, yep. Perfect. Okay, so uh, our next meetup, um, we were gonna we were gonna shoot to do um, in Madison Square Garden with uh, thirty thousand of our closest friends, <laughs> but we couldn't get it, um, unfortunately. So uh, the next meetup is also going to be a virtual meetup. Um, uh, the good news is that uh, obviously this is open to every, every, everyone in the Drupal community. So if you have friends who've always wanted to experience the NYC Drupal meetup and, and haven't been able to because they're not in New York City, please let them know. Um, uh, we'd be happy to have uh, uh, your friends and coworkers and your friends' coworkers and all that good stuff join us. Uh, it will be, as per usual, the first Wednesday of the month. That's June 3rd. Um, RSVPs are open on the uh, meetup.com. Um, there's a, a bit.ly link down here and uh, please, you know, please make sure that you join and bring two friends. Um, as always, a reminder, we're always looking for people to help us um, uh, with talks and presentations and topics and things of that, you know, of that nature. So if you have a, an idea that you really want to talk about, um, please uh, come into Slack, into the organizers room, let us know. Uh, we'd be thrilled to, to have people. I know that we've been lining stuff up. Um, uh, for the next couple of meetups. So please uh, uh, volunteer yourself or volunteer someone else. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so this, this is the conclusion of our second uh, uh, virtual meetup. Um, we'll see everybody at Bill's Bar in, uh, in a couple <laughs> minutes. It's downstairs, exit out the right. Um, no, just kidding. But everyone stay safe, stay healthy, and, uh, and you know, Come visit us in Slack and, and stay in touch with everybody. Thank you to our speakers. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Yay. That was awesome. Thank Yay. you. Clap, Yay. clap, clap. Yay. All right. Thanks to our emergency MC. <laughs> there you go. Hopefully, hopefully, I'll be able to MC from the beginning all the way to the end. Yeah. <laughs>
anybody who wants to stick around, anyone who wants to stick around and chat, um, or or you know, tell war stories. There we go. Check it out. Jeff, are you on a treadmill? Good. I am. Well done. Well done. Well done. Uh, but anyone who wants to stick around and uh, and chat, feel free. And uh, the, the meeting will remain open for a little while. But uh, I don't know about the recording, so just bear in mind it may be recorded. Um, so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. I got to do a bedtime routine. So good night, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. All right. Bye bye. Thank you. <laughs>